Welcome, everybody. Just like my colleagues have said, uh, the subject of, of our speed meeting is going to be what are the actual boundaries of the sky and the future of the airborne warfare systems. For today's speed session, we would like uh, to ask to join us Mr. Mark Supko, who is the Vice President, International Business Development, BAE Systems, Electronic Systems, and Mr. Zach Sherman, Foreign Policy and Strategic Studies, Lockheed Martin Aeronautics. Okay, once again, welcome. And uh, just like my colleague has said, this is a very uh, dire subject to, uh, to me. And probably to some of our guests, we got a General Breedlove with us in here, and this is not a secret that he was, uh, he used to be an F-16 pilot, and he knows how important uh, ruling the sky is. So let me start with the first question to Mark. Mark, I just uh, recently I have visited your webpage, I mean uh, BAE web, webpage, and I've seen this beautiful Tehranis UAV. And it's a uh, beautiful aircraft with a beautiful stealthy features, probably packed with the latest technology, but this is a bomber probably, and a ISR platform. And can you tell me, do you think UAVs can replace main tactical, tactical fighters? And is it possible to replace fighter pilots with an autonomous systems? I, I don't think so. I think that in the future what you'll see is a mix of the two. And there, there's a reason for that. There are, some, um, there are some high threat areas where you just don't want to send a manned aircraft if you can get away with it. Um, I think oftentimes if you, as you look at uh, how we're doing with manning in the different air forces, um, it's easier to send out a, a mixture of manned and unmanned aircraft. Um, and, and I think more importantly, though, if you take a look at uh, the advantages that a pilot brings uh, in terms of uh, experience, uh, a diversity of thought, a diversity of experience, those are things that you can't put into an unmanned aircraft. So even if you have an autonomous aircraft with, with the latest technology, the latest, um, um, the latest uh, versions of AI in it, you can't bring that, that diversity of thought, that diversity of experience that allows for innovation on-the-spot innovation when faced with a, um, a situation that requires it. So I, th I think what we'll see is a, uh, you, you'll, I don't think you can ever take the pilot out of the situation. These are, you know, kind of like war words on my heart because, uh, you know, very often when I speak to some scientists, they say, forget about pilots, uh, you know, in the future in the, in the sky because this is the, 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 weakest, uh, the weakest thing, the weakest chain and, uh, and uh, it can carry only nine Gs, right? So good, good to know. All right, and uh, Zach, a question for you. Yes. The battlefield of future is all about precision strikes, right? But with the anti-access and the area denial capabilities, it will be difficult to gather information about potential mobile targets such as S-300, S-400, uh, ballistic cruise missiles launchers. In order to hit them, we have to pinpoint exact locations uh, of those mobile threats. The uh, ISR systems uh, that we have right now, main contemporary platforms, cannot really reach targets that are more than around 100 miles in depth. Satellites, we know all the you know, limitations of satellites. Look at the weather that we have in here in Europe. So electro-optics, IR, you know, forget about that. And uh, geostationary satellites, probably not for the intelligence. So do you think real-time targeting, and I want to stress it, real-time targeting, in the future will be done mostly by small, cheap, multi-sensory, multi working in cloud UAVs doing targeting via triangulation of signal bearings? Uh, yes, and you hit on uh, some very good points. And I, actually, uh, to piggyback on what Mark said, I, I think you need, you need both. And it is part of that manned, unmanned teaming, uh, which is what a lot of uh, air forces and, and naval uh, operations are looking at right now. 
Uh, you hit on a couple of the tenets of air power. Um, being an F-16 pilot yourself, I, I know you understand those. Uh, there is a future uh, tenant of air power, which you mentioned, space integration, uh, cyber integration, um, air superiority, obviously, is the cornerstone of that. Uh, but able to be able to do joint ISR is a, is a very important facet of the future of air power. And having those uh, uh, interoperable systems work together, whether it be uh, a fifth generation aircraft that's able to get in close, uh, where stealth is inherent, used to be a, a, um, an advantage for, for the United States and for the Alliance um, in various conflicts, but uh, now it's inherent. It is the new baseline for uh, the future of ISR and C2 for the, uh, for the Alliance and the coalition. Thank you. Because uh, as a uh, F-16 fighter pilot, I used, to, I used to be flying F-16s, and uh, I know how important the precise, uh, precise munition is, and uh, with the standoff capabilities. But very important is actually the location of the target. If you want to put some uh, uh, put some uh, precise weapons, Absolutely. standoff weapons on the target, 200 or 300 miles in depth, you have to know those locations. And, Absolutely. Uh, and uh, the ISR systems that we have right now doesn't really fit into this uh, pattern with uh, the anti-access area denial uh, capabilities of the potential openings that we, that we have. Okay. Yes. Zach, a question for you. Actually, Mark, a question for you. What are the implications for Poland as air warfare technology advance? I, I think it's multifaceted. I think what we'll see is um, uh, first of all, it's the speed of the way uh, it's the it's the speed at which technology advances, um, which is going to require us to be able to to do technology insertions into aircraft baselines much more often. So the aircraft so Polish industry needs to be able to adapt to that. Polish industry needs to be able to develop new solutions, new technologies, um, so that as technology advances, the aircraft can advance to meet the new technologies that are out, so that they can address the new threats. Um, I, I think what that's going to require is, uh, and it was interesting, I was talking to um, uh, some individuals earlier, and they were talking about how, how Poland's actually going out, finding new companies with technologies, developing those technologies, and applying them to, uh, to the defense industry. I think that's going to be necessary. Uh, if, if it isn't, um, if it's not done adequately, then what's going to happen is, uh, I think what you'll find is Polish industry will fall behind what's actually required of them. So if, uh, if it continues, I think it's a good, a good thing. Um, but you're going to have to get this from small, uh, smaller companies. Uh, you'll have to find those companies that have new te you know, small kernels of technology and allow them to cooperate and work with larger companies that then reduce the risk of that development and the insertion into larger platforms. Uh, uh, do you, as a BAE, do you have any examples of uh, cooperation going on right now with uh you know, but uh, Polish companies, what, can you name some technologies that, that you are thinking about, you know, implementing in here in Poland? We're, we're currently working with a few, uh, a few companies for some of our, uh, uh, our, our guided weapon systems, but I'm, I'm really talking about, uh, say, finding those little kernels of technology that reside within Poland itself, because Poland has, Poland has some, um, some specific threat, uh, threat issues that some of the other European countries and, and the U.S. don't have. Um, you know, Poland resides within an A2AD bubble. That's something the U.S. Air Force doesn't have to deal with coming from uh, further in, in Western Europe. So, so as those issues continue over the years, we're going to, I think what you'll find is that um, if Poland can grow their own technologies and develop them and then team with a larger, uh, perhaps a larger aircraft manufacturer, whether that's um, uh, a Western uh, aircraft manufacturer or or have small companies team with, say, one of the PGZ companies. And I think I think that'll that'll develop solutions that help to address those specific threats that Poland's facing. Probably would help in, in terms of, uh, for instance, F-16s in here in Poland. Probably would help if we have a little bit more of those aircraft, because at that point we would have some ingenious uh, capabilities in terms of uh, maybe modernization. Uh, some deeper logistics, but with 40 aircraft, it's uh, not really feasible at that point. And uh, I cannot help myself having in here the representative of Lockheed Martin to ask a question, since 
since we all know that we have not enough F-16s, or you know, I already name it, <laughs> right? But uh, me as an F-16, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Viper baby, so I will always advocate for some a uh, F-16s because I know how awesome weapon it is. But we know that we need in here in Poland, our Air Force need more aircraft, and uh, and it's uh, from from some assumptions we as a as a country we should have around 150 to 200 sure. fourth generation or fifth generation sure. platforms. And just recently in uh, in the news there was a rumor that India is buying a lot of uh, they supposedly is going to be buying new aircraft for they are looking for fourth generation aircraft. And right. uh, and there was a rumor in uh, in the news that Lockheed Martin is thinking about opening a production line F16 production line in India. Do you think it will be feasible for Lockheed Martin thing to open that line in here in Poland if, for instance, uh, Polish government decides to buy 100 or 150 F-16s. You know, I'm just a retired, uh, <laughs> retired uh, colonel. I'm not a politician, so I can ask those questions. Right? <laughs> yes, uh, and, and obviously that is a uh, politically uh, motivated scenario that, that uh, you know, I'm can't necessarily uh, comment on the inner workings of it. But um, yes, it, it has been reported uh, that India is interested in producing a single engine uh, aircraft facility, whether it be a, uh, a possible Gripen model or an F-16, uh, transitioning a production line under the Make in India uh, initiative that Modi has established inside the country. Um, it's it's a it's a sad, it is a sad day. I sympathize with you uh, on the drying up of of the F-16 uh, potential new customers. There are a few out there that we believe um, are on the horizon. Um, just uh, two weeks within two weeks ago, uh, Bahrain was uh, released um, by the by the White House to obtain uh, a, a fourth generation fighter. Um, but you make a you make a very good point. Uh, you mentioned uh, the quantity, and I think it's important to have both because uh, you operate in a, a variety of ways. And uh, it, it, make no mistake about it, fifth generation fighters make fourth generation fighters all that much better, 300 percent better to be exact, um, in in every way. Uh, Ten times the power, uh, more range, um, undetected can shoot, uh, sh shut down power if they need to task for generation fighters. Um, we've seen that uh, and demonstrated that with F-22 fighters um, in, in multiple theaters in the U.S. and abroad. So um, do I think it's possible? I I'm not really uh, positive as I'm not the uh, business development representative for, for opening a new production line uh, abroad, but um, I I'm sure there will be uh, government-to-government -government conversations to be had on that topic. Thank you. Mark, question for you. Where do you see the most advances taking place in the future air warfare? I, I think there are several areas. Um, from our perspective, and my, my sector of uh, BA systems builds, uh, we, don't, we don't build the aircraft. Uh, we build the, the systems that make it shoot, move, and communicate. Uh, so. Uh, what we're seeing is uh, we're seeing a lot of advances in artificial intelligence, uh, information fusion, uh, sensor fusion, uh, and, and that's critical because it, it allows uh, the pilot to get the information faster. It allows the pilot to get the information in a, a manner that it can be used with less, less, um, uh, less work uh, to actually uh, manipulate the data. Uh, because of that, the pilot is, um, is able to perform his job a little bit more easily. Uh, so there's less fatigue, and he becomes a much more effective uh, uh, fighter. Um, so I think seeing the two of those come together, uh, artificial intelligence allows us to, to take large chunks of data, put it together, use it effectively, uh, make decisions that pilots don't have to worry about. Um, we can also make decisions that require high speed. And then information, information fusion, uh, sensor fusion, allows the pilot to, to see things a little bit more easily. And some of the new aircraft, what we're seeing is uh, with some of the helmets, um, some of the helmet-mounted displays, uh, everything's put up in front of the pilot. So no matter which way the pilot looks, it's there. 
Um, and so as we, particularly as we start to come up with some of the new uh, off-bore sight uh, missiles, that's important because now the pilot's going to be able to use look 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 left and right to be able to engage targets as opposed to looking straight down a HUD. And, and it's that fusion of information right in the pilot's face that allows them to do that. So speaking of which, I just remember one exercise when I, uh, when I was flying our fancy new F-16 Block 52 with uh, J Hammix and M9X and uh, I was shooting somebody that was pretty much behind a 3-9 um, uh, line. It was a Greek guy, and he at the debrief, he's asking, "Hey, you're lying. You were shooting pretty much, you know, and it was uh, it was impossible for you." And I said, "This is a M9X, baby." Yeah, and uh, and uh, Jay Hammix, definitely, this is the coolest uh, thing. But uh, mostly people think that this is air to air. Seventy percent is air to ground. And talking about the new uh, new systems that helps uh, and or a new way of. Uh, of uh, waging a war up in the air, uh, Zach, the question for you. Uh, because we know that uh, emitting electromagnetic uh, energy right now uh, up in the air is marking your position. Sure. So uh, radars, we're probably going to be using radars differently than we use right now. Even now, we are using a tactics where we are just uh, switching on the radars at the end game. So sure. do you think, and F-35 is a very good example because this is a sense, a sense of fusion. Radar is kind of like a, another tool that the system, uh, the entire system is using. So do you think we are looking at the end of the radar era? Uh, I wouldn't necessarily that, say that because the more nodes that are in the network, the better. Um, you mentioned shutting off, turning them on. Um, one of the benefits of, of having a fourth and fifth generation team um, added to that, all the sensors uh, that, that BAE supplies and the systems that BAE supplies on the F-35, um, and then all, obviously the ground systems, the Aegis radars, uh, the MEADS system, the interoperability of those nodes in the network, um, as well as our U.S. Army uh, manned personnel on the ground. I think the more the better. I, I don't think uh, we're seeing the end of that. We're just starting to figure out the concept of operations for fifth generation fighters. Um, where uh, we've experienced fifth generation aircraft teamed with even C-17s, C-5s, uh, F-18s, F-16s. You've seen the na naval integration concept, uh, interoperability concept uh, being performed with unmanned aircraft. Um, as a as a network no, uh, node in the system, so um, I think I think every platform will be a node in the sensor network. Okay, and uh, I'm a huge admirer of F-35, and I personally I think if uh, my country has enough uh, resources, they should definitely uh, go into it and and buy it. And this is a beautiful aircraft in the concept uh, where you are taking the workload of the pilots and. Right. Uh, sensor fusion and most of the stuff is uh, prioritization, all that stuff is done by the computer. This is an awesome concept and, and this is uh, definitely the future. But do you think uh, personally that we are getting into the wall as far as the weapon system prices? Because uh, uh, at some point we'll be, uh, the, the weapon system will be too expensive for, for the customers. And uh, f for instance, uh, when we were buying F-16s in uh, uh, 2003, we have decided um, uh, pretty much the, uh, the price were 50% of, uh, of the F-16V version that we, that we have on the market right now, not even talking about F-35 because F-35 is totally different a uh, price range. And uh, do you expect... Uh, the price of the F-35, do you expect the price to go down? And if yes, what price range would that be? Or you would think that that would be going even, even higher as, for instance, F-16 prices? Uh, I'll take your, your last question first. Uh, no, uh, there has not been an increase in, in the uh, slope of the curve on the cost of the F-35. It's actually going the other direction. Um, we have proven uh, and, and demonstrated um, on the A model specifically uh, over 
beaten every estimate over the past uh, five years and a 60% reduction in, in cost. So uh, obviously when you, when you produce these systems, whether it's the F-35, the F-18, the F-16, um, the, the buzzword is concurrency, where you do the system design phase at the same time, EMD phase, as you do the actual testing of the aircraft. Um, most advanced systems are like that. Uh, at Lockheed Martin, we have the benefit of having an organization called the Skunk Works, uh, which has developed a lot of the technologies on fourth and fifth generation aircraft. Uh, the vertical lift fan uh, that's on the F-35B, the F-117, which was referenced in one of the photos earlier, uh, for example, had a two-year IOC. Um, the XP-80 aircraft that Skunk Works developed uh, was delivered in uh, roughly 10 months from concept to first flight. So um, while systems today receive a lot more uh, uh, criticism, whether it be from uh, rumor or media or political uh, decisions, um, the, f the facts are what they are. Uh, you asked what the price is. Um, as I said, it, we're coming down the curve by 2018. It will probably be at a fourth generation price, somewhere between 80 and $85 million for an A model. Um, and, and there's a reason why we have 12 countries on the list uh, for the F-35 A, B, and C models. Uh, so, but a big, big driver of that obviously is quantity. So um, just as the F-16 was produced in massive amount of quantities, um, that helped keep the price down and helped become a foreign policy geopolitical tool for success. And in my mind has forged many relationships uh, in, in all areas of, of the world. Okay, so to continuing this, uh, this subject, because uh, just like I said, uh, you know, I would, by all means, I would want to see F-35 in Poland very soon, sure. right? So, uh, assuming hypothet hypothetically, if tomorrow Polish MOD puts a back, you know, full, uh, you know, uh, you know, full of money on the table, saying we want 50 F-35s, based on today's orders, when would the delivery be done? Uh, well, as a Lockheed Martin person, uh, I, I can't directly answer your question just because it is a joint program office um, and that's something for the United States government and the Polish government to work out. So I can't uh, comment on, on even hypotheticals. But I will say, um, you know, th there, there are uh, uh, many active campaigns right now for the F-35, uh, especially within NATO and our partners in, in Asia. Um, we have the FACO in Italy. We have the final assembly checkout FACO in Japan. Um, so uh, in, in our mind, in the United States mind, um, you know, having that interoperability of all the systems, I think, is key. Thank you. Mark, uh, question for you. I know that you are not directly producing typhoons, but you are a part of the consortium that produces it. So a question for you, can you advocate a little bit uh, for Typhoon and uh, can you tell us if Typhoon would be a good replacement for our MiG-29s that uh, probably sooner or later is going to be history? Um, it, it, it's hard to say. It depends on the requirements that you're looking for. Typhoon's a great aircraft. Um, uh, the, uh, some of the business areas within our sector produce a lot of the uh, uh, components that go into Typhoon. We do. Um, uh, most of the flight controls, uh, helmets, HUDs, that sort of thing. So it's a, it's a very advanced aircraft. It's a very adaptable aircraft. And BA Systems is uh, about to get a contract, if they haven't already gotten it, for um, uh, upgrades to the Typhoon for, for the Royal Air Force. So it's, uh, it, it, it could be a potential fit, depending upon the requirements. But I think it's, uh, it's a very good, good aircraft that would uh, fit. It's good price, good capability. And it's a European one, right? Yeah. So. So probably the money would be spent in here in Europe and everybody exactly. would like it. You know, right. we didn't buy Caracal or we didn't uh, end up this Caracal discussion. So, you know, we would probably have some smiles back on uh, our European colleagues back, right? Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much. We, uh, we just came up to the end of our, of our uh, short conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.